Good afternoon and welcome to our Friday Focus um, presentation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. As many of you know, this is our ongoing series of lectures and conversations that are inspired by the muse museum's permanent collection and special exhibitions. Today's presentation is in conjunction with Metropolitan Vanities, the history of the dressing room table, which is on view now through April the 13th. Metropolitan Vanities locates the origins of the dressing table in ancient uh, Egyptian decorative boxes and traces its evolution in Europe in the late 17th century and through to the present day with examples that are drawn exclusively from the museum's collection. So it's a really rare and wonderful treat to have departments working together to really highlight the strengths of our, of our rich collection. When you're walking through the exhibition upstairs, and I hope you've already had the chance to do that, one of the things that's really striking about it is that from time to time you'll catch your own reflection in one of the dressing tables or the vanities as you're walking by. And in doing that, in many ways, it's the actual, actualizing or the object itself comes to life, and it's because of your presence that's there. And in many ways, this kind of just very loose observation became the cornerstone for an idea for a lecture that could complement the show. And that brings me to my introduction of Kathy Pice, who is joining us this afternoon um, to further explore this idea, if you will, of what happens when you sit before a dressing table. Kathy Pice is the Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols Professor of American History at the University of Pennsylvania, where she teaches courses in U.S. cultural history and history of sexuality, women, and gender. She is the author of Cheap Amusements, Working Women and Leisure in Turn of the Century in New York, Hope in a Jar, The Making of America's Beauty Culture, which was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Award and is very pertinent to um, this afternoon's topic, and most recently, Zoot Suit, The Enigmatic Career of an Extreme Style, which received the 2012 Milia Davenport Publication Award of the Costume Society of America. In addition, Kathy has received um, numerous fellowships, including from uh, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Smithsonian Institution. She's also a fellow of the Society of American Historians. Cheap Amusements um, served as my introduction to Kathy's groundbreaking scholarship. Her exploration of the leisure culture that catered to the working class young, to working class young women in turn of the century in America really in many ways just opened my eyes to a new way of looking at and really seeing Ashcan school paintings, like the paintings of John Sloan, and really looking at these women and realizing that they were individuals and not just these anonymous figures that populate these paintings and other photographs that we see from that era. And as I had mentioned before, when this exhibition came onto the docket and knowing just some of the other work that Kathy has done, I couldn't think of anyone better to really invite to tackle this topic and really take this on. And I just want to add that today's lecture is in many ways a little bit out of the box from our typical art historical presentations in that we're really looking to kind of flesh out this experience and we're going to be focusing on a very specific moment in some ways of time and focusing on the modern woman and the context of America. So I have talked enough now. I want to hand this over to the one and only Kathy Pice. Please join me now with a very warm welcome for her. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's a great honor for me to be here, um, to have this opportunity to speak at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, as the exhibit shows, and if you haven't seen it, I do hope you will, um, the dressing table has been, for hundreds of years, an object of tremendous craftsmanship, artistry, and elegance. Um, dressing tables seem to have invited a special care and creativity by the designers, um, even as they are marked by their owners for a certain social status and culture. Um, having written a book on the history of American beauty culture, I have to admit I mainly thought about cosmetics and beautifying in relation to women's public activities as beauty entrepreneurs and as consumers engaged in modern activities of work and leisure. And I wrote about the importance of self-transformation, what in today's parlance would be known as the makeover. But I really hadn't given any thought at all to the place of transformation, the spot in the bedroom or bathroom where women put on their faces, do up their hair, and prepare their entrance into the world. What I want to explore with you today is what dressing tables have meant in the past in the United States, and especially how women thought about and used vanities in complicated ways. What happened at the dressing table is tied to how we think about the self and beauty, 
to status and dignity, to socializing daughters and remembering loved ones. So the dressing table, which is a place that on the surface seems a private place, is also at times oddly public. And many of the images that I will show you today reveal this. They were made for public consumption by artists exploring feminine images of beauty, by advertisers and marketers who were pushing products, even by government photographers who were documenting poverty and government welfare programs. So what happens at the dressing table? Let's take a look at um, some of these images by very self-aware artists. There is a tradition of depicting the nude at the dressing table. This is a setting for showing women's form, typically as she arranges her hair or puts on cosmetics, before a mirror that, that doubles her face or her body, providing a different perspective on it, as you can see there. This is a moment before dressing. It's an exposure of the body that still gestures to women's self-fashioning. These works were all created by American male artists, and they seem to me equivocal. There's a sense of the erotic in Freisecki's painting, but that's absent from John Sloan's drawing and Archibald Motley's painting. The women are looking back at the artist, and they're looking back at you um, in a way that is challenging and to some extent discomforting. The dressing table also appeared in cartoons and caricatures. Here are two women of the Gibson girl type um, on the, uh, uh, the Columbia's Easter bonnet on your left, um, in which a woman is putting on a fashionable hat that is in fact a symbol of American expansionist power and imperialism. The hat is a, is a boat with the feathers being the um, uh, smoke coming out of the boat, um, a very buoyant view of um, what happens at the dressing table by a woman who symbolizes the United States. On the right is an optical illusion that may be familiar to many of you, um, all is vanity, um, in which the woman looks into the mirror that in fact turns into a sign of death, a skull, um, creating the, um, a, a very literal sense in which all is vanity. The dressing table has also been a site of critique directed against women, exposing their supposed vanity and deceptiveness. Painting yourself, making a false face was seen as an illegitimate um, kind of activity, and here it is exposed at the dressing table. And on the right, this um, uh, somewhat extreme makeover. This woman's not a flapper, she's actually in her underwear, um, putting on a wig and her maid is blowing up some kind of padding there that will give her um, the proper hips um, and um, the long hair. Here, the title of this um, piece is The Chassis 1915 Model Made to Order, Built to Order, and of course the reference to the early um, automotive industry is quite present. Such critiques of femininity and beauty can be seen in a different light in the work of feminist artists of the 1970s. In this installation and performance piece by the art collective Woman House, which also focused on the vanity. The table is a monument to cosmetics and creams, and it was based on a description in one of Colette's stories. The performance piece, which you can see um, there, involved a woman incessantly applying layer after layer of makeup to her face minute after minute, hour after hour. The creators of this piece called this a room of lush beauty and suffocating oppression. So these works tell us something about what is perceived to be the problem of the dressing table. It was a place of dubious values, particularly for women. Harmful self-absorption, an obsession with beauty, falsity and deception. But some artists suggest that something else was happening at the dressing table. Self-reflection that lay under the surface, contemplation of an image, uh, here a contemplation of a miniature, which we don't know what is, is the picture on the miniature, perhaps of herself, a younger version of herself, perhaps of other people. In any case, a contemplative image. Uh, in these photographs, too, we see um, a range of uh, sense of what is happening at the dressing table. 
the the um, act for the actress. This dressing table is so bound up, not only with performance but with her actual work, that she has put light bulbs around the dressing table that is in her home. She can only make up um, at the vanity as it would be in the theater. And on the right, the photograph of Susan King, an older woman than any we've seen so far, catches half of her face reflected in the mirror, just above the bottom of the mirror. So these suggest to me the dressing table might be part shrine, part sanctuary, a place that involved the self not only in beautifying, but other kinds of self-fashioning. So one of the striking things um, that I found in trying to do some research on how women use dressing tables is that from at least the mid-19th century into the mid-20th century, there is a widespread expectation that women must have a dressing table. They were important home furnishings, even um, to the majority of women who could not afford the glorious vanities that we see in the exhibit um, here at the Met. And women paid close attention to them when visiting other people's homes and in creating their own. Women in the 19th century in their letters and diaries commented extens extensively on dressing table styles, coverings, ornaments, flowers, photographs. Um, one woman who stayed in a, one of the finest houses in San Francisco in the mid 1800s um, described how her dressing table, and this is a quote, held two large pitchers, two mugs for teeth, two boxes of toothpaste, and two looking glasses, one high and one low, brushes and combs. Women saw it as their space with its own proper order. They complain when men left their keys and their collars on their dressing tables, or if the baby had grabbed the skirt of the dressing table and pulled everything off. Some cast an eye at the vanity as a marker of status. There's a famous um, Southern woman diarist, Mary, Chestnut, uh, Mary Boykin Chestnut, um, who most historians read largely for what she has to say about slavers, slavery in the Confederacy. And at one point she attends the wedding of the daughter of one of the largest slaveholders in South Carolina. This was in 1863 in the midst of the Civil War. And she comments on the bridal chamber, and especially the Duchess drawing table, uh, dressing table, decorated with inexpensive muslin and lace. And to her, the appearance of this table symbolized how even rich families had to make do during the war, and how important it was not to appear too extravagant. What she said was, this was an, a millionaire's attempt at appearing economical so that the style placed the family more on the same plane with their less comfortable compatriots. Um, she also comments that this light fabric, it was muslin, um, caught fire during the wedding ceremony due to a candle and the bridal um, suite was ablaze and um, you can only imagine the, what a metaphor that might have been either for the wedding or um, the Civil War um, itself. As you can see here on the right, um, this is um, from the Sears catalog of 1899, women could purchase mass-produced dressing tables. These are actually not so cheap. Um, the, this, uh, this is a picture of the cheapest model at the top. It was $10.50, which in today's um, currency would be $300. Um, and in the middle, you can see um, illustrations from Godey's Ladies Book, which explained to women how to create a fashionable toilet table using such fabrics as cretonne, chintz, or glazed muslin with lace trimmings. And they instruct women how they can make it fancier or plainer depending upon their other furnishings and her taste. What is especially striking is how often women made their own dressing tables out of scraps and discards to create a space of beauty and for beauty, often in places that offered primitive living conditions. Um, one woman named Anna Daly Morrison kept a diary about her days living in a construction camp in Idaho where her husband ran an engineering uh, company that built dams. In 1915, they moved into a makeshift home um, with dirt floors and little furniture, furniture. And she describes how she created what she called a snazzy looking dressing table by finding several egg crates and sewing a skirt out of cretonne. 
um, these do-it-yourself projects were also taken up by young girls and you could read in the newspapers how to make your own dressing table using a dry goods box as a base, covering it with fabric, taking a mirror from a broken down dresser, and then trying to get your friends to give you gifts of toiletries that you could put on top of the table. And these would be, as this newspaper said, an object lesson to the girl in good taste. So such a lesson takes a kind of bizarre turn. Um, you may be wondering what is going on in that image on the right. Um, this is an illustration to some very detailed instructions on how to make a dressing table and washstand in the wild. Um, in the 1910s, there was this big interest in camping, hiking, and the out of doors. It was called the tonic of the wild. And it was for girls as well as for boys. Um, this guidebook uh, on the trail says, Camp is the place where girls enjoy most proving their powers of resourcefulness, even when it came to grooming. So here it explains how you can create a shelf from the side of a wooden box or from branches, attach it to a tree, cover it with bark, and hang your mirror on a nail. Um, you can even make a little comb holder out of twigs. Thus, making and having a dressing table was instructive, teaching girls a sense of beauty, but also how to be capable and practical and to take pride in the knowledge that they could live comfortably in any conditions. Now, as we move into the 20th century, um, the dressing table became a growing part of the visual culture, especially the commercial visual culture um, of the country. You can see it in fashion magazines, women's magazines, films, and advertising. Appearing in this way, the dressing table was an intimate look into a private space. So this was a very public kind of intimacy. Vogue, here's this image from Vogue, um, and the magazine Arts and Decoration, and a number of others highlight the artistry of the dressing table. As this um, uh, article says, this is a wise form of vanity. This isn't women gone wild. Um, they're not overindulging in beautifying extravagance or narcissism. These are refined and graceful, modern, identified with wealthy socialites, tastemakers, and celebrities, examples to admire and emulate. Um, and these are just three of dozens of photographs that um, photographer Samuel Gotcho made. Um, he was a commercial and architectural photographer, and there are thousands and thousands of copies of his photographs, some are at the uh, Museum of the City of New York, some at the Library of Congress. And he photographed the dressing tables of numerous um, uh, women of wealth um, or, um, or society or celebrities, um, from Helena Rubinstein on the left to um, Claire Booth Luce's dressing table on the right. And in the middle is a kind of um, relatively inexpensive dressing table look that you could create um, that was presented in Good Housekeeping. That these photographs were intended to be instructive about proper taste and wise vanity is suggested by the caption of this photograph. So this is a photograph of the wife of Claude Pepper, who was a senator from Florida. Um, and here she is needing little artificial makeup to enhance her beauty. Um, she is shown at her dressing table getting ready for a Washington social affair. So re realize this is a posed photograph. She's made a decision to look this way. Um, and the caption makes very clear um, what is an appropriate level of vanity um, for women. But one of the things that I think is interesting is that dressing tables were important to women who could not afford luxurious furnishings. If we look at photographs of the homes of poor, rural, and working class women, white women and African American, remarkably, we see dressing tables. This evidence comes from the late 1930s when photographers were employed by the New Deal's Farm Security Administration, um, which sent them out to rural and urban communities to document the lives of the poor. One of these photographers, Russell Lee, seemed to have a particular interest in dressing tables. 
Here we see a child of a farm worker in front of a dressing table in eastern Oklahoma. And actually, this location, Vian, Oklahoma, is very near where the novel The Grapes of Wrath begins. So just imagine that um, setting of migrant laborers. laborers. Um, it has a covering, which it's hard to tell what it is, um, oilcloth, perhaps. A hurricane lamp for, in, for illumination, a jar of cream, and a kind of broken down baby doll. Um, and it has a stump for a seat. It creates a dressing table out of what is available. Here, too, we can see um, an image of a sharecropper's daughter in southeast Missouri combing and smoothing her hair in front of the, mirror of, the, of the mirror of a dressing table. Um, the photo quality is poor, unfortunately. That's about the best I could get. Um, but you will notice that there are newspapers on the walls. This was very common as a form of insulation in what were sort of paper-thin um, shacks. We can see that the top of the vanity is just a jumble of, um, of stuff, um, even, however, as there is a woven runner on it a gesture to taste and aesthetic. Similarly, the wife of a sharecropper does her hair in front of a similar piece of furniture. So this two-drawer dressing table is very common. Um, and they, they look almost identical. They're not quite the same. They're, they're very similar. And again, we see an array of materials on the surface. At the same time, this gesture of feminine grooming is seen repeatedly in these photographs of touching the hair, of smoothing the hair. Even more than beauty, I think this woman is creating a sense of her own dignity, asserting a kind of respectability in her appearance and in her dress. It is a personal moment, yet it is caught by the photographer. It's not a snapshot. We have to imagine that this was posed. So what are the circumstances in which that happened? What was the photographer looking for? And how did this woman, woman want to look? What we do know is that Russell Lee had gone to New Madrid County to document the La Forge project, which had put a number of agricultural workers into new prefabricated houses as part of the New Deal's efforts to improve their lives and working conditions. And so perhaps these dressing tables are symbols of the worthiness of these migrant workers. These are not poor trash or unfit people. Even in conditions of deprivation, they create a dignified appearance. This is brought home, I think, in this final image from um, Russell Lee, um, in which um, he shows a woman who had moved into the new housing. And here she is also fixing her hair, but now in front of a clean, new, probably homemade dressing table, at least the skirt of that looks homemade to me, with a simple modern mirror and a restrained group of jars on the surface. So this is what um, New Deal programs will do to you, do for you um, through the images of dressing tables. Okay. So if women of all sorts were drawn to the dressing table as a meaningful site, so too were beauty product manufacturers, advertisers, and retailers in the 20th century. Um, this really peculiar um, contraption um, a hand vibrator, which will improve your complexion and grow your bust somehow, um, had to be demonstrated clearly by putting the woman in front of a dressing table. And she's definitely having a good time of it. Um, this was consumer culture at the vanity. Vogue magazine ran a regular column called On Her Dressing Table, beginning in 1900, and it ran for over 35 years. It encouraged women to create their dressing tables that were both charming and practical, with silver or ivory combs and brushes and elegant perfumes and toiletries. What's interesting about this column, and it's hard to see in this um, reproduction, is that they also named um, the products themselves and put prices on them, but they would not tell you where to buy them. It, they actually said that um, you had to write the magazine if you wanted the names of the shops where the dressing table articles could be purchased. As you can see here, 
um, by um, uh, on the right, the issue of cosmetics, of the use of cosmetics, had suddenly become one of the reasons that dressing tables were again being promoted. Um, to equip our beauty tables, we spend $700 million a year. Makeup has become one of the fundamentals of living, like potatoes with meat and automobiles for the country. Um, in the hands of advertisers, uh, oh, one, one uh, more before I go there, um, the motion pictures also played a very important role in presenting a new kind of image of the dressing table, one that was far more exuberant, one that in many ways celebrated um, the excess of beautifying in a way that the Vogue images simply did not. This is a still from a 1924 silent film called Men. The film has been lost. Um, it does not exist. But um, this picture was used by drugstore, um, uh, drugstores and retailers in order to sell um, cosmetics more broadly. So in the hands of advertisers, the dressing table itself becomes a sales counter. And you can see here in these ads, which were made for the retail advertising marketing industries, it makes clear that women could be reached in the intimacy of their homes. As women gaze at themselves in the dressing table, as on the right here, the t radio can advise them on the proper care of the skin. Thus, commercials would make up her mind while she makes up her face and listens to the radio. There weren't a large number of advertisements that place women at the dressing table, but those that did tap into a particular s sense of desire. And I'm going to show you um, a series of ads from this um, time period in which women are located at dressing tables. So these here, this is one type, which is a kind of both sensual and narcissistic image in which women are touching their bodies um, as on the right or even in this case kissing herself in the mirror so absorbed are they in their appearance um, for the viewer of course this is a somewhat voyeuristic um, image um, in the case of the um, toiletry jeer kiss I think that's how it's pronounced um, the gift of beauty is both the toiletry and the woman herself. Um, and the ad on the right, for Ubigan, this is for makeup, and yet we do not see her face. We only see her exposed back, um, reaching down almost to uh, a little bit lower than that. It's the sheerness of the product that perhaps is represented by the sheerness of, um, of her skin and the exposure of her skin. Ads also suggested how the vanity could be a point of transformation from a private self to a public self. Um, on the right, the actress, and you see a number of ads with actresses at their mirrors in the theater, the actress literal, literally is preparing herself for a role and for an audience. Um, and the text of this reads, night after night, she must face a thousand critical eyes. And this notion of facing critical eyes is one that this company links to what any of us, any woman would do when she goes out at night, when she is, goes to a party. She's always exposed to critical eyes. And that means she's got to have flawless skin. The ad on the left for Edna Wallace Hopper um, connects, um, if you can see the little vignettes as they go uh, along from the right down to the upper right down to the bottom left, um, it connects the um, privacy of the dressing room in which the woman is making up in the first two vignettes down to her public life, an active out of doors life, riding horses, playing golf, um, so that linkage between the private and the public sphere. Um, and it says, of course, it is easy to change your face not hard at all. And now Edna Hopper Wallace was herself an actress who was, at, in this time period, in, 19, in, the 19, in 1929, she was 60 years old. And she, um, at least, I mean, maybe she was um, photoshopped a bit or just drawn, um, young, looking young. But she was always said to be the woman of 60 who looks like she is 16. So the product really works no longer exists, unfortunately, <laughs> alas. 
We also see ads where the dressing table is a medium of fantasy, where women can imagine romance or the pleasures of wealth and culture. Um, you see here for Resinol soap, a woman looking into her mirror at the dressing table and seeing, um, it looks almost like a motion picture, that it becomes a motion picture screen. And uh, the um, ad for La Creole hairdressing instead suggests an historical romance with a depiction of Louis Philippe's reception in New Orleans in 1798. And I guess that's the Creole part of La Creole. Here is where you can imaginatively put yourself in a scene and at the same time engage in self-assessment. Are you ready for romance or for the thousand critical eyes or for that matter for Louis Philippe? In the World War II years, the dressing table has an added meaning, which conjures up the absent and desired man. Um, this uh, <coughs> evening in Paris ad gestures to the vanity. You can see it's uh, the skirt of the vanity um, just outlined there. There is no mirror here, um, but a sketch of the cloth covering, some cosmetics, and a photograph of a soldier. And the ad turns on the issue of sexual attraction. So the term it, which went back to the 1920s and basically meant sexual att attraction, sexual magnetism, um, spell it to the Marine. They still understood what that meant in 1943. Um, and the ad uh, itself says, the Marines love trouble. And evening in Paris can spell heart trouble in any man's language. <laughs> I don't think they meant like coronary, um, but uh, rather um, just that, that moment of great attractiveness and attraction. And Charles of the Ritz um, here is the classic World War II combination of yearning, wartime duty, and individual feminine pleasure. Um, the instruction is actually to a man, I think, to a husband or a fiance. She's speaking to somebody on the phone. And it says, give her a war bond and anything by Charles of the Ritz. And she will be happy. Um, if we compare these ads to um, some of the government photographs of women workers in the war, we can see how well the advertisers rendered these appeals. Um, and this is a kind of interesting ad. Here the cosmetics are stowed in the cabinet, and that's seen as a, as a um, highlight. It's a kind of new phenomenon um, at this time. And the dressing table, without all the cosmetics on it, instead becomes a shrine um, to um, absent um, family members and perhaps um, absent um, husbands and um, boyfriends. Um, objects here might bring back a memory. There's this very odd um, statuette here um, on, the, on the table. Um, the other thing that is really um, unusual about this ad, and I have no idea what happened in, uh, of this photograph, I had no idea what happened in the making of it, but you can see the, this one image has the um, can of soup up on the top here, and then in the second close-up, the can of soup is now <laughs> with the cosmetics. Again, this sense of something that is practical, um, patriotic, um, and not um, overly excessive in the way of beautifying or self-involvement. These war workers, too, um, uh, are reflected in the mirror back here. Um, and they um, also uh, have a kind of um, shrine to their objects of beautifying as well as um, photographs of men. And the other um, image here of um, war workers um, who have a very small vanity table. You can see that these are um, housing um, situations in very cr close quarters, and oh, a very tiny vanity table is available to the women here. And um, what is interesting is that women in the armed forces during World War II were very much like the women I described earlier in the late 19th century. They were making their own vanity tables. In um, a letter that one um, army nurse um, wrote, her name was Anna Shelper, um, she was stationed at a field hospital in New Guinea. And um, the um, soldiers had sort of put up this um, very rough um, housing for them. And she describes how she made a, quote, nifty dressing table using ammunition boxes, yellow muslin, 
and a fin rack, which I still don't quite know what a fin rack is, um, for a stool, which he also covered in, in muslin. So here, too, that notion of the resourcefulness of women seen among the campers was in full evidence. And that's true as well of these schoolgirls who, during the war, were making their own dressing tables um, with um, discarded vegetable crates and um, burlap. And you can see they're fairly primitive in appearance. Um, this, too, is a photograph from the Farm Security Administration, and, so, and Russell Lee is, is, is the photographer. So you have to think that there's a purpose behind this. This is not simply about young girls wanting the dressing table, but also about the appropriateness of, um, of these um, daughters of farm workers. Uh, they're, um, they're being deserving for having this kind of housing and how they were able to affect their good grooming um, through um, making their own um, dressing tables. Indeed, it seems to me that the importance of the dressing table simply grows for girls. That it's, it's as we move, for, move into this period of the mid 20th century, um, that it's about their socialization. It's very clear in the war years. It also seems to me to involve a connection that mothers and daughters have between each other. Um, again, to quote from a diary, of um, a novelist this time. Her name was Agnes Sly Turnbull. Um, in 1939, she is creating a dressing table for her daughter, Faith. And um, she puts up new lights um, and sews a taffeta petticoat um, with a um, little embroidered um, uh, piece to it for her dressing table. And her daughter is ecstatic, She's radiant. Um, and Turnbull comments on her diary. Uh, in her diary, I made it thinking as I worked what a little, a very little time it is since her desires were a new doll and a teddy bear. I mourn a little for the passing of the toys, but I love each phase of her growing. Um, and so here too, I think the meaning of the dressing table expands beyond simply beautifying. It involves family connections and particularly connections between mothers and daughters. So these kinds of feelings um, may continue to the present day, um, but I will have to say that it as we, I move further up in time trying to research how women use dressing tables, it became more and more difficult to find that kind of evidence. Um, it seemed much more prevalent for girls that the dressing table was an important um, piece of furniture um, for girls, um, that it involved their doll play. And of course, there is a kind of consumer culture that is oriented specifically, the marketing is oriented specifically to children, especially in the period after World War II. And so businesses saw these girls as a ro robust market. And you can see here um, the cutout um, dolls from the mid-1950s. This is a kind of Marilyn, it may even have been Marilyn Monroe, um, the American Beauties. And if you look at all of the paper dolls, there are lots of dresses, but they also have you make a little dressing table for her. So it continues to be important. Um, and um, surfing the web, um, one can find any number of um, these really garish, um, odd-looking dressing tables for, for um, very small um, girls. This is the Disney Princess Enchanted Cinderella Vanity. It seems like a lot is mixed up there, um, a lot of references. Uh, and this was, is sold at Walmart. You can easily find it. Um, and the girl, of course, is um, made up with her hair up with a kind of, uh, you know, the sleeveless dress, um, but a kind of old-fashioned, old-timey dress, a little princess, um, princess look. For adult women, um, it seemed to me, seems to me that the dressing table did go into um, decline, that, dress, that um, cosmetics found their way into the bathroom cabinet, as you can see here. Um, there are numerous blogs that just show um, women, there are photographs of women's um, bathroom cabinets and all of their makeup. 
Um, it may be that um, with small bedrooms and bathrooms in the home after World War II, that there was actually little space for a vanity. Um, in recent decades, an even smaller vanity has emerged, which is the dashboard. Um, <laughs> you can see here, makeup while driving. And this um, um, is, is, a, is a screenshot from, um, it's, uh, from a, a university, I think, maybe Portland State University. And um, what is um, very interesting about it is, um, if you're not, it says, if you're not careful, putting on makeup while driving can result in a negligent driving infraction, or worse. Uh, and then it says, if you absolutely must put on makeup while in the car, use these helpful tips to keep yourself safe while looking good. And if you click on that, you actually have this very long description of how you can put on foundation, eyeliner, the whole thing, you know, while you're stopped um, um, in traffic, or even while you're just zooming along the um, freeway. So that says to me this isn't simply about space. It's some, it says something about, or technology for that matter, it says something about how women think about how they create their appearances, where they create them, what the relationship between where they create them and the rest of their lives is. Um, this may be a subject for, I mean, maybe during the question period we can talk about that. Um, but if this has disappeared as a phenomenon in recent decades, it seems pretty clear to me for a sizable portion of American history um, that the, for women, the dressing table was in fact a multifaceted space. It mixed the public and the private. It expressed desires for beauty and status, most certainly. But that also mingled with a desire for dignity and an assertion of dignity, which is a different thing than um, a desire for beauty, um, for practicality. It was at times a shrine for contemplation, a place of memory, of thinking about absent um, members of your family, a place for the self, and a place for self-transformation. A lot can happen at a dressing table if we only take a close look. So I'll end there. Thank you.